Okay, well, uh, good evening, everybody. Well, you've, you've heard who I am. I'm Dr. Jim Wiles from the Department of Physics at, uh, at Lancaster University. And uh, it's, it's good to get an audience out on, a, on an evening when the weather isn't so great, especially when we talk about a very different kind of weather. In this case, um, weathering solar storms. Um, we're talking about space weather. So, uh, so just to give you some kind of idea of some of the, uh, of the effects of space weather, some of them are very, very beautiful. They're changes in our space environment. Um, and this is uh, one of my own. There are not very many slides, uh, photographs taken in this presentation that I've taken. But this is actually a photograph taken out of the back of my bedroom window about two weeks ago. Um, uh, and I live not too far from Lancaster, just uh, slightly away from the city lights though. And you can see that on the northern horizon, looking north here, um, there is a very clear green glow in the sky there. Um, and, that, uh, and that was taken with me balancing on the bedroom window, uh, trying not to wake up my wife. Um, taking, a, taking a picture, um, and, uh, and, and that's a consequence of space weather. So the northern lights, which you do occasionally see from here in the UK, uh, are, are one of the most obvious manifestations of, of our links to the sun. Um, and this wasn't just seen from my back window, this is actually uh, another view, not, not by me, uh, taken up near Shap, so a few miles north on the M6. Really great views of the northern lights, and this was only two weeks ago. Um, and the reason that happened, the reason that you could see the northern lights from the UK, is that the Earth was being bombarded by material from the, from the sun. And so uh, what I've got in this next shot, you know, in, this, in this next uh, movie, is uh, some data from uh, a satellite which is sitting between the Earth and the sun, and is always staring at the sun, so it's doing what we should never try and do. Um, and it's been built specifically to do that, and it has um, a rather special camera. So it, the first thing you notice with this image is there's a, there's a circle in the middle, and that's a little disc in front of the lens, which um, will, will block out the glare of the sun. So where I'm standing on the stage at the moment, I can't see very many of you because of the lights in here, but if I wanted to, I could shelter my eyes from the lights and suddenly I'd be able to see you. Well, this, this camera has the, same, uh, has the same problem. If it wants to see around the area around the sun, it has to block out the sun so it's not dazzled, so that's what this disc is. And the little white circle in the middle is, is roughly where the sun would be in that image. And what we're actually looking at here is, um, this is actually, there's three or four frames here taken over a couple of hours and it's just looping through them. And you can see that there's, uh, there's this sort of streaming material all around the sun. And that's actually the solar wind. That's uh, subatomic particles, uh, mainly uh, protons and electrons in the solar wind. And it's reflecting and scattering light towards us. And this camera is recording that. And what you might just be able to make out is that although there sort of seems to be material streaming off in all directions, there is actually a, a, there's a bit of a loop here. And as this movie loops, you can see it sort of moving out from the sun. Hopefully you can see that. And that's actually the beginnings of a, a coronal mass ejection. So the, 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 the sun's atmosphere is called the corona. And so as the name suggests, a coronal mass ejection means a load of materials being thrown out from the atmosphere. And on this particular day, you'll see the date in the bottom left, 5th of October 2012, <coughs> That amount of material came earthwards, um, and it took a couple of days to arrive at Earth. And when it arrived, its interactions with the Earth's magnetic field created the northern lights, which you could even see from the northern UK. And I hung out of my bedroom window to look at. So that complex set of interactions is, first of all, controlled by the Earth's magnetic field. So I've got a really nice sort of textbook cartoon of the Earth's magnetic field here. And uh, this is... We, we can approximate the Earth's magnetic field to something like an enormous bar magnet. So in high school science, you can take a bar magnet, put it under a piece of paper and put some iron filings on. And you get a pattern showing the, the field lines that emerge that show you the shape of the magnetic field going from one pole of the magnet to the other. And the Earth is very similar. So we have magnetic field coming out of the South Pole and going back round into the North Pole. And human beings have known about this for a very long time. If you want to navigate, you can use a compass because generally the field lines will point towards the North Pole. Your compass needle points along the local field lines. So your, your compass points north. So there's nothing new here. Um, and this has been uh, surrounding our planet since it was created. So it's about four and a half billion years old. So there's, there's no news here. But we also live on a planet with a nice thick atmosphere. Now, I'm a sucker for movies of the Northern Lights, so here we've got some movies of um, the Northern Lights taken out of the window of the International Space Station. Again, you probably noticed I didn't take these images. <laughs> but what you can see here is that, is that just above the Earth's atmosphere, there is this glowing Northern Light. Sorry, just above the Earth's surface, there is this glow of the Northern Light. Um, and that's just showing you where the Earth's atmosphere is. Normally, it's quite difficult to see the atmosphere, but in this case, it's glowing bright green, so it stands out like a sore thumb. 
And what's happening here is material is raining down from the space environment. It's actually spiralling down the Earth's magnetic field lines and running into the Earth's atmosphere as it does so. And as it runs into the Earth's atmosphere, and it, we're mainly talking about electrically charged particles like electrons. In your body, there are billions of electrons. These ones have been stripped away from their hydrogen atoms in processes that go on in the sun, found themselves getting trapped on the Earth's magnetic field and, and run down into the atmosphere. And they cause the atmosphere to glow, a bit like the effect in a neon lamp. The oxygen in the upper atmosphere will glow pink or red, depending on the conditions. And so sometimes in these movies, um, you can even see that it, you don't just get this flat layer of glowing northern lights you, or, or southern lights if you're over the southern pole, the, the aurora australis. You'll sometimes see that there are a clear structures, sort of like vertical stripes and bands in this. So this is a particularly poor example, but as it moves on to another example, hopefully we'll get to see one. OK, so there we can see these vertical stripes. That's because in the polar regions, the magnetic field of the Earth comes down into the atmosphere. So material is coming down those. And, and those structures, it's effectively, it, the, the northern lights is painting the Earth's magnetic field for us to see. So we've known about magnetic fields for a long time, and people have been seeing the northern lights for a very long time. Um, so the, the, again, there's, there's nothing new here. This is just a natural process that's going on all the time. But for about the last couple of hundred years, scientists have been trying to work out what it is that causes this process. And we're going to just have a quick look at that, that thought process because it will then start to show what space weather is and how it can affect you and I and, I and our everyday lives. So this is, um, this is a cartoon. This is from a paper. This is from a scientific paper written in, in 1930s. Um, and actually, uh, it, it betrays what scientists thought at the time. So it was thought that, the, well, we have the Earth here, and it was thought that every now and again, the sun, when it was particularly active, would some, some material would erupt outwards and come towards the Earth. Well, um, and so the, the, the authors of this paper, uh, what they did is they, they had a thought experiment. They thought, well, what happens if you have a front, if you like, a, a front of material moving through space, and it arrives at the Earth, where well, it will sort of engulf the Earth and move around and fill in behind us. So it's a bit like uh, the water in a stream going around a rock. And they thought that the, the solar wind just occurred sporadically. So this material in space only occurred when the sun was particularly active. Well, we now know that's not quite true. We know it's there all the time. So, so the, the solar wind is always leaving the sun. It's always leaving the solar surface, um, and it fills the solar system. But, but about uh, 80 years ago, it was before the advent of the space age, it was thought that it only periodically threw out material. Well, if we fast forward to the end of the 1950s, um, we've got these three gentlemen. Um, looking very pleased with themselves, and, and, and so they should, because they've just put the first ever US satellite into orbit. So bear in mind we're in the space race here, we've got two superpowers. The Soviet Union had put Sputnik into orbit, beating the Americans into orbit, so rather embarrassing for the, for, you know, the world's greatest superpower. Um, and these guys, four months after the launch of Sputnik, end of the 50s, had put a, a spacecraft into orbit called Explorer 1. Um, now, there's a couple of people here I want to point out. Um, this is a model of the, of the satellite that they're, they're holding aloft. And this guy in the middle is a guy called James Van Allen. Um, and we're going to hear more about him and that name in a moment. And then his colleague to his left, or on, on the right of the picture, who's looking very pleased with himself, is a chap called Werner von Braun, who was um, a German gentleman who was basically the father of the German rocket program in the Second World War, who surrendered to the Americans at the end of the Second World War, and then basically pushed, was, was a, one of the key figures that, that ended up putting Neil Armstrong on the moon. So, so, uh, so there's interesting history in here. But in the late 50s, he was part of the team that put the first American satellite into orbit. And on the no in the nose of this satellite, they put in a Geiger counter. Um, you sometimes get the impression that perhaps they just needed to fill some space on the satellite and needed some ballast, or perhaps someone decided it would be useful to put some science instruments on there. But they put a Geiger counter on there. And as soon as this thing got out into space, it went crazy. It detected all sort of radiate, all different types of radiation. You could detect alpha particles, which are, are helium nuclei, and it could detect beta particles, which are electrons. It could detect protons. It's all sorts of electrically charged particles. Space seems to be full of them. And they seem to be concentrated in belts around the Earth. So imagine the Earth around the equator. There were belts filled with these trapped energetic particles. And now, now an alpha particle and beta particle, that's you learn that as, as a radioactive particle, it's radiation in, in your high school um, science class. And so you've got the radiation belt surrounding the Earth, and they're sometimes called the Van Allen belt, named after James Van Allen. And they look a bit like this. If you draw a simple cartoon, then to scale they look a bit like this. Um, you have um, two belts, uh, you have um, electrons and protons in the inner belt, and mainly electrons in the, in the outer belt, and they, they surround the Earth in sort of donut shapes, or torus shapes around the Earth. And there are very high uh, fluxes, very large numbers 
of these energetic trapped particles in these regions. So straight away, as soon as we got to the beginning of the space age and we could put instruments into space, we realised that space wasn't empty, it was full of energetic, electrically charged particles. Um, and, and contrary to that idea that we looked at a few slides ago from the 1930s, where space was generally empty apart from when the sun threw out a load of material, what, as soon as we got beyond the Earth's magnetic field, we realised that the solar wind was there all the time. So this is another one of these movies. These are called coronagraphs, by the way. Uh, they allow you to look at the solar corona. And so it's, it's just like the image we're looking at, this is actually from 2000, and we've got about a month's worth of data here. And so the stars are moving in the background because our, sp our satellite is actually in orbit around the sun. And it orbits the sun at the same speed as the Earth, so it always sits between the Earth and the sun. So if you want to imagine you're a satellite for a moment, then over your shoulder is the Earth. Um, and, and all this material is streaming out. So you can see all this material streaming out into the solar system. About a million tonnes every second is leaving the sun out into the solar system. Uh, stars in the background are moving as our field of view changes. And you may notice, the keen-eyed amongst you may notice, uh, at one point, a, I think a comet comes in and disappears into the solar atmosphere. And at the end of the movie, you can see there is a planet coming in. It's not a UFO. It's actually, I think it's Venus. Um, but this is a constant stream of particles. Every hour of every day, the sun is emitting material. It's called the solar wind. Uh, and out here at the distance we are from the sun, here on Earth, if you took a sugar cube sized volume of space, so that's about one cubic centimetre, then there's about, let's say, 10 particles in that sugar cube sized volume. So probably 10 protons. If you imagine doing the same trick in this room now, if you imagine a sugar cube sized volume at the end of your nose, there's about a billion, billion atmospheric particles in that volume. So out in the space environment, it's all spread out very thin, but space is not empty. There's, there's still stuff out there. And that's what you can see streaming out from the sun here. And, and as well as this constant steady stream that's going on all the time, you can also see that occasionally there are explosions of material. So you get these sort of puffs of material being thrown out. The sun is firing material out into the space environment all the time. And those things are called coronal mass ejections. We've already mentioned them. It's about um, a billion tonnes of superheated electrically charged gas called plasma. It's a billion tonnes of plasma moving at a million miles an hour through the space environment. So this stuff's got a lot of kinetic energy. When it arrives, a billion tonnes of plasma will do some damage when you get a head-on collision. And also it's electrically charged particles as well, so it can, it can interact electromagnetically with the Earth's magnetic field. And so the solar wind is what drives space weather. Sometimes space weather is very disturbed, the sun is very active. Other times space weather is quiet, the sun is pretty quiescent and we've just got a steady breeze from the, from the sun. Now, um, the sun will actually, is actually carrying out uh, a, a nuclear fusion process, and, and the processes that do that result in the solar atmosphere being magnetised. And that plasma, as it comes out through the solar system, will drag some of the sun's magnetic field with it. So when this solar wind that we just saw, that was this sort of nebulous, gassy material, arrives, it's got embedded in it some of the sun's magnetic field. And that magnetic field can interact with the Earth's. And so if we think just a simple common sense knowledge of some, of some magnets, two magnets, if you take the same poles, the two north poles, they'll repel each other. But if you take a north pole and a south pole, they'll attract each other very strongly. So um, anti-parallel field lines, opposite polarity field lines, can interact very strongly, whereas like polarity field lines don't interact very strongly. And so you get a coupling between the solar wind and the Earth's magnetic field. So, so put on the side of the Earth facing the sun, the Earth's magnetic field is compressed by the constant buffeting of the solar wind. It's compressed and squished inwards. And on the night side of the Earth, the side pointing away from the sun, the field is stretched out into a long magnetic tail that goes thousands of planetary radii downstream. And so uh, we get these interactions set up where oppositely directed magnetic field lines can come close to each other. One of them will be attached to the Earth and one of them will be in the solar wind. And they can merge and start to, and start to uh, their orientation, their topology, the shape of the field lines can change because of this merging process. Um, and that can go on, for example, on the day side of the magnetosphere. So when that happens, magnetic field in the solar wind actually can hook itself into the Earth's magnetic field and drag field lines around and start moving and pulling the Earth's field lines around. And that can also occur in a similar process in a, on the night side of the Earth, where we actually have a slightly different orientation of field lines, but we can get anti-parallel field lines, coupling, merging, reconnecting, and then we get a reconfiguration of the field. And the takeaway message from these kind of movies and these schematics is the magnetic field in the solar wind 
hooks into the Earth's magnetic field. And that constant motion of the solar wind away from the, from the sun, which is carrying with it some momentum and energy from the sun, some of that will find its way into the Earth's magnetic field. And so that idea that scientists had about 80 years ago or so, that we lived in this magnetic field, which was we, we were like a little rock in the river of the, of the occasional solar wind, wasn't really the complete picture. We don't live in a, what we can call a closed magnetosphere, where our field lines go from one pole of the Earth to the other. We actually live in a much more open magnetosphere. The region of influence of the Earth's magnetic field is very open to the solar wind, and it can lead to a very compressed day-side magnetosphere, stretched out on the night side, and field lines which can be stretched out and coupled into the solar wind. So variations in the strength of the solar wind and the speed of it and the orientation of the field in that solar wind will completely change the coupling between the Earth and the space environment around us. And so usually that gets summarised in pretty NASA pictures uh, that look a bit like this. And so um, the key thing to take away from these is that we're not isolated. We don't live in an environment where we're just hunkered down from the space environment around us. We are coupled electromagnetically into the sun and into the space environment around us, and so are all the other planets in the, in the solar system. So the question is, what's this got to do with, with space weather? Well, those changes in that environment is, is, is what scientists would possibly call space weather, but it, it, there is an applied side to this. It's very interesting. So scientists like me would find this interesting and we want to study it for its own sake. But there are also some, some really applicable um, engineering issues and, and high-tech systems which, which will interact with, the, with space weather, which make it kind of important for everyone in the room, even though you may not realise it. And so this is actually another movie, um, and I've got this one. And, and this one's actually um, just a little bit different in that we've actually composited together three different movies here. So we have three different types of images, images looking at the sun. Um, and actually, in, in the centre one, you have an image of the solar surface, um, it's actually an extreme ultraviolet light. Um, it's been colour-coded green, uh, just so that scientists like me who are too lazy to read labels will know that that's an extreme ultraviolet light image. Uh, this red one is then a coronagraph looking at the region around the sun, so it's blanked out the sun, and we can see the solar wind emerging from the sun in the region out to just a few solar radii. And then this is a wider field camera looking at the bigger picture. And this is, some, this is a couple of, uh, or a few days' data from the end of October, the beginning of November 2003, so nine years ago. And what we have uh, here is, well, the keen-eyed amongst you will have already noticed that at one point during this movie, there's clearly lots of activity going on, there's material being fired out from the sun, but at, at one point in the movie, um, everything goes very snowy, all the cameras stop seeing things and it all gets lots of interference on it, it looks like a sort of badly tuned TV picture. Um, and that's actually a coronal mass ejection that had been fired towards the Earth. So there we go. It's actually engulfing the spacecraft as it passes over it. And those highly energetic particles are causing noise and damage to the sensors, which is why it goes all snowy. So you've just been absolutely you've just been hit in the face by a billion tonnes of superheated plasma. Um, and that really didn't do very much for this spacecraft's longevity. Actually, the solar cells, which are designed to interact with solar radiation, received such a large dose of radiation, it, it sort of degraded their performance and shortened their lifespan quite measurably. You can see it on the decay curve of the performance of the solar cells on the satellite. And a couple of days later, oh sorry, a couple of hours later after this spacecraft was engulfed by uh, material from the sun, uh, you could start to see the effects on the ground at the Earth, which is something we're going to come to in a moment. And this was actually an event which we call a Halloween storm, because it occurred about this time of, of, of year. Um, but what's happening? Well, this is a complex science-y cartoon um, that scientists would use to try and explain what's going on. Uh, I'm not sure if it makes it any clearer or not. But just to orient yourself, what we have here is the Earth in the middle. And then the Sun is in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, but a very long way away. And we're actually looking at the Earth's magnetosphere, this sort of um, bullet-shaped cavity that we live in, <coughs> with the shaped by the Earth's magnetic field. So this is the dayside magnetosphere starts here and it goes up over the top and this is the North Pole and the tail stretches off a long way off towards the top right. So we're kind of looking down into a cutaway. And what it's trying to show is that really what could happen is in the solar wind lots of energy is, 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 is flowing past the magnetosphere. If you imagine as it gently buffeting the magnetosphere, so perhaps tight changes then suddenly there's a big wallop as a big coronal mass ejection arrives so it's constant buffeting the magnetosphere. All the magnetic field lines inside the magnetosphere feel that buffeting. They all compress and relax, compress and relax as it's going along. And sitting on those field lines are lots of electrically charged particles, 
Some of them have leaked in from the solar wind. Some of them actually come from the top of the Earth's atmosphere and have been accelerated outwards by heating. So we have this magnetosphere. It's filled with electrons and protons, lots of electrically charged subatomic particles. And they're sitting on these field lines that are rocking back and forth, that are wobbling around. And you can get some very interesting interactions between the magnetic field lines and the particles that are sitting on them. And the best way to think of it is, if you imagine a surfer on the ocean with a surfboard, then what the surfer will try and do is align himself to the direction of the waves and get himself moving at just the right speed so that he can couple into the energy of the, uh, of the waves. He can get a resonant cu coupling occurring and his surfboard can then pick up energy and speed and momentum from the wave and you get carried in towards, towards the beach. Well, in this case, particles that are moving at just the right speed or have just the right energy or in just the right part of the magnetosphere will couple into the wave energy coming in, this buffeting coming in, and will start to get souped up, if you like, energised up to much higher energies. And so what we actually have here is a particle accelerator. And actually, these red regions in this cartoon are the radiation belts. And we think that they're, they're pumped up with lots of energy. So these are the Van Allen belts. They're pumped up with lots of energy where, due to wave motion through the, uh, through the magnetosphere. It's magnetic waves coming through. And there's a whole zoo of different processes that can, that can energise up particles in the magnetosphere. And some of them will stay close to the Earth. Some of them will actually get fired into the atmosphere to create the northern lights. Some of them stay trapped on field lines, so you don't see them from the ground, but you know that they're out there. And so you can get actually lots of different regions of the magnetosphere. And there's a couple more of these scary um, cartoons with lots of magnetic field lines on them. But what they're showing is, is that there are lots of different regions with different energies associated with them. And actually, the radiation belts are some of the highest energy um, regions of the magnetosphere. Uh, in terms of how fast the particles are moving in that region, which is basically, basically a measure of their energy or their temperature, the particles in the inner radiation belt can be hot, much hotter than the, the particles in the sol near the solar surface. Um, the thing is, at the solar surface, there tends to be a, a very large number of them for every cubic, cubic metre, whereas in the radiation belts, there aren't very many. So although they're very energetic, there aren't very many of them. But they're still there, and they can still cause some interruptions to, to, and some problems with, uh, with satellites. And so the radiation belts was something we, we, we mentioned, started off with, with James Van Allen um, in, the, in the late 50s. They're still very poorly understood. You'd think the first discovery of the space age, we'd now nail that, we'd know exactly how that works. Well, the truth of the matter is we don't. Uh, we don't fully understand how particles in the radiation belts get up to such high energies as they do. I mentioned the surfboard uh, model of, of picking up uh, energy from waves in the magnetosphere, from oscillations on the field line, being energy being transferred into the particles. That doesn't really account for how fast they're going. So it's a bit like me saying, explaining to you how a surfer worked, but then you saw a surfer moving along at 200 miles an hour. It would be a bit odd. The, 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 the description of how we think of a surfboard might work doesn't really account for getting to very high speeds. So uh, it's actually a current uh, s s um, area of inquiry. And so this, um, when this actually decides to do its thing, this is actually um, an Atlas V launch vehicle taking off from uh, Cape Canaveral in, in Florida uh, at the end of the summer. And this was uh, carrying two NASA spacecraft into orbit around the Earth in order to go, as the Americans would say, on a mission to return to the radiation belts to figure out some of the processes that go on that, that wind up the energies of particles in the Earth's radiation belts and how that links into our coupling with the solar wind. And so this is the radiation belt storm probes mission, and it's actually a pair of satellites, lovely NASA animation here. Um, and I've got colleagues at Lancaster who are itching to get their hands on the data, the first data when it starts coming back, as these spacecraft are specifically designed to fly through the radiation belts and, and find the high energy particles um, in there and then trying to look at how they get accelerated. Again, you might think, well, why didn't we do this a long time ago? And the truth is that we generally try and make spacecraft not fly through the radiation belts. Um, if I just move on from that lovely uh, animation. This is another schematic. This is a, a NASA schematic showing roughly the two radiation belts, the inner radiation and the outer radiation belts around the Earth. These are the, the Van Allen belts. Um, the spacecraft are specifically designed to cut through them one after the other. They follow each other around in the orbit. And the reason you have two is... You can, make a lot, you can get a lot of information about flying through the same region at different times. Um, so if you have two spacecraft flying through the same region and they see exactly the same thing, even though they fly through perhaps a couple of hours apart, you can make some inference about how much that region has changed in the intervening period. Probably not a lot, if that's the case. But if the two spacecraft fly through the same region two hours apart and see something completely different, it tells you that what's going on in that region is actually quite a variable thing. It's not always the same. And so there's a lot of clever planning going on to put these orbits into the right place. 
but you would usually build spacecraft to avoid this region because in here uh, there are lots of particles at very high energies, uh, electrons with very high energies. Um, now the scientists in the room, uh, these would be MeV electrons, mega electron volt electrons. So these are very fast moving electrons. For the non-scientists in the room, uh, they're often known as killer electrons. Um, and killer electrons because they're not terribly good for satellites. Um, they have a nasty habit of burying their charge, so you have an electron carrying some electrical charge, they have a nasty habit of being absorbed by things like semiconductor chips. And so your semiconductor chip gets an extra little bit of charge in it somewhere, and that basically changes a zero to a one somewhere in its memory. Um, and that can have very bad consequences if that was an important piece of circuitry that controlled the spacecraft's main computer or its pointing direction or something. So although there's lots of redundancy, these killer electrons can cause problems with satellites. Uh, and just the number of them, the number of these um, negatively charged particles flying through the spacecraft can cause an electric charge to build up on them. And if you get different amounts of charge building up on different parts of the spacecraft, you can get arcing, a discharge, a spark, which again isn't very good for, se for sensitive electronics. And when your satellite goes wrong in orbit, you can't call an engineer who comes along with a pair of overalls to fix it. If your satellite goes wrong in orbit, unless you can fix it from the ground in software and sending it commands, then that's it, it's game over. So these things are expensive bits of kit, and the radiation belt storm probes are specifically radiation hardened to go and study these regions. But the reason why you or I should worry about this, um, even if you're not interested in the space environment, is that I will try and just overlay on here um, where most of the Earth orbiting satellites are. So if I do this, what we have here is um, a schematic, an artist impression of the distribution of Earth orbiting satellites. Uh, the distribution's approximately correct, but the satellites aren't. As you can see here, these satellites would be sort of the size of Scotland if this was correct, but they're, they're blown up in size so you can see them. But what you see here is this, this very obvious ring is geostationary orbit. Gravity works in such a way that the, amount, the speed that you go around a planet and therefore the time it takes to orbit a planet will depend on how far away you are from the planet. And there's a really convenient sweet spot about 36,000 kilometres above the surface of the Earth where a satellite will go around the Earth every 24 hours. So it will go around the Earth in exactly the time it takes for the Earth to rotate. In other words, the satellite stays above the same point on the ground which is really useful for bouncing signals around, great for communication. But it only works at that one distance, so it's why you see this ring. This is busy real estate in space terms. So there's lots of satellites here in this, uh, satellite in this geostationary orbit. Now if I go back, this was a bit of a, um, a, a, a rough approximation, but you can see that the Earth on those two is approximately the same size, and you can see that in this cartoon, the, radiation, the, the, the satellite geostationary orbit is about the position of the radiation belt. Most of the time, geostationary orbit is just at the edge of the radiation belt. But when space weather is bad, when the sun's very active and we get lots of material heading towards the Earth, um, and, and then interacting with the magnetosphere, these particle acceleration processes get pumped up, we get lots more material in the radiation belts, a lot, more high a lot higher energy, and the radiation belts swell and expand. And that expansion of the radiation belts can engulf geostationary orbit. So suddenly the satellites in geostationary orbit start to see a much higher, much harsher radiation environment. And so just from engineering terms, it would be useful to understand that and be able to know how, how tough to build your spacecraft, when to perhaps not launch them. So you wouldn't launch a ship into a typhoon, a, you know, a regular ship on the, on the ocean, you wouldn't launch into a typhoon. You wouldn't launch a spacecraft into a particularly bad radiation environment. You, you, you try and avoid that if possible. Um, so if you're interested um, in having a go at trying to find some of these features coming from the sun, then first thing, the first advert would be you might be interested in Solar Storm Watch. This is a project actually run by um, some British scientists um, who, are, who have uh, cameras on satellites studying the inter interplanetary environment, studying the space between the sun and the earth. And so if you want to get involved, this is a great citizen science project. Um, and this particular project uh, allows you to go and look at real data and actually try and find coronal mass ejections leaving the sun and heading towards the Earth. Now, you might think, well, why, does, why do they let people do this? Machines are absolutely terrible at pattern recognition. It requires a lot of PhDs to be able to write a computer program that will make a machine do mach do, to take an image and, and say, that's a person, that's an apple, that's a banana. Trying to actually make a machine say, yes, that's a coronal mass ejection, it's heading towards the Earth, is really quite tricky. What you can do, though, is you can basically turn it into a game. 
you can serve lots of images to people and people you let them run through a few training scenarios and see what you've got to spot in the images and then what you do is you say say the same give the same image to say a thousand people and after they've had their training you'll find that 950 of them will all agree with what's what they can see in that image and there'll be 50 balmy people who say it's something different but you can throw that away and go with the crowd and that is a good way of crowdsourcing this kind of this sort of um, this sort of project. So, so if you're interested in having a go at this, they've, they've basically they've gamified spotting coronal mass ejections coming towards the Earth. And you, as you progress through the game, you become a planetary defender and all this kind of stuff, and it's great fun. But you are actually doing useful science. The whole point is not to waste people's time; it's getting to do useful stuff. So, SolarStormWatch.com is great fun if you if you fancy having a go at that. But this is um, just an example that I'm not making everything up. So, what we have here is a movie, which if I Press the button, we'll start. And it all looks a bit grainy, so let me just tell you what we're looking at. This is actually some data from uh, one of the heliospheric images on NASA's stereo mission, British-built images, hooray. Um, and uh, they will constantly stare at the space between the Earth and the Sun. So actually, from where you're looking, the Sun is off a long way to the right, and the Earth is off a long way to the left. So you're looking at side-on at the distance between the Earth and the Sun. And these little grainy things in the background that are drifting along are stars in the field of view moving. Now what you will, your eye will be drawn to is this little thing here, and that's uh, Comet Enki. And this little chap visits the inner solar system every three years or so. Uh, it's a big ball of ice and slush. It's about five kilometres across. Um, and as you will notice, at some point during this movie, it's, it, the tail of Comet Enki seems to just wander off. Um, if you look really carefully, what you'll notice is it's because something comes along and actually blasted off. There's a, there's a structure that moves through this. It's oriented in the, up, in the vertical direction. Here it comes and takes the tail away. And that's actually a region of, of dense solar wind uh, that has come, basically a, a fast region of solar wind coming from the sun has caught up with a slow region, compressed it, and it's pushing it along through space. And when it arrives at this comet, um, and this was in 2007, I think, November 2007, um, when it came, arrives at this comet, this, this tail is just blasted off into the space environment. You'll be pleased to see the comet regrows its tail very rapidly. No comets were harmed in the making of this video. <laughs> but um, you can see this is one of the first, first real instances where human beings have seen a solar system body interacting with the solar wind directly. So that's a comet, and it wasn't harmed. But you can imagine on a bigger scale, um, th this sort of process will interact with the planet, with the atmosphere of some planets. So if we take a trip through the solar system for a moment, if we think about Mars, Mars has, is quite small and it's got cold quite quickly. Um, if you just think of your everyday experience, if you fill a, um, a mug of water from the hot tap of the bath and then fill the bath up and you, put the, you just walk away, the mug of hot water goes cold very quickly and the bath doesn't. And that's because the bath loses heat typically through its surface, um, whereas it contains heat in its volume and there's a ratio between the, the surface area and the volume. Um, and it's much more favourable for the bath to hang on to water than the mug. It's got a big surface area and not much volume. Mars has got the same problem. It's not very big, and so um, it's lost a lot of its heat. It didn't have very much heat, and it's got a relatively large surface area, and it's gone cold. And deep beneath our feet, in the outer core of the Earth, there's a, a, a nickel-iron mixture of molten material churning around, generating a strong magnetic field. It acts like a big dynamo, and that's a lot of heat left over from the formation of our planet four and a half billion years ago or so. Well, Mars was formed at about the same time, but it went cold very quickly, and that molten core solidified. And so there's no churning motion generating a magnetic field. So Mars has no strong magnetic field. And as a consequence, it doesn't, can't create that magnetosphere, that bubble, that cavity in the solar wind. So the solar wind can actually come right down to almost at the surface of Mars, where it can tuck into the, uh, the Martian atmosphere, and it just blows it off into the space environment. So the reason Mars has a very thin atmosphere is most of it's just been carried off into the space environment by interactions with the solar wind over the last four billion years or so. That comet was being interacting with the solar wind. That's what, you sh that's what makes a tail on the comet. But then we saw how a, an intensification of activity from the sun sent out uh, a, a wave of material that interacted with the comet and actually knocked the tail off. So we know that the solar system interacts with planets in natural environments. But then human beings come along, and we're clever things. We like to build things and go places and do, do exciting things. And so a fantastic image, you know, pinnacle of human achievement, um, the Apollo program on the surface of Mars. Well, some people will say that you couldn't possibly go... Sorry, on the surface of Mars. <laughs> Damn, my government minders will come and shoot me in the head after saying that. <laughs> um, 
So uh, some people will say that these people never went to the moon even. Um, now, they'll say you can't get through the Van Allen belts. It's impossible you'd die. Well, you can actually work out the radiation pretty easily. It's kind of A-level maths and you don't die. Um, but most people who say that have never tried it. Um, but um, the, the radiation dose you will get in the space environment is stronger than you would on the surface of the Earth because you're missing two things. The main thing is you're missing the Earth's atmosphere. The Earth's atmosphere protects us from particles and, and electromagnetic radiation, X-rays and gamma rays. It's great. But the Earth's magnetic field shields the atmosphere. So if, if, with Mars, where you have no magnetic field, the atmosphere has been blown away. The radiation environment on the surface isn't great. With the Earth, we're lucky. We've got a two-stage defence system. The, uh, the magne magnetic field shields the atmosphere from the solar wind, and actually the atmosphere then shields us from lots of uh, nasty radiation. Well, if you're on the lunar surface, you've got a bit of a problem, but for about a week every month, the, the, the moon's orbit takes it through the Earth's magnetosphere, through the Earth's magnetic field, so it gets some shielding effect. But the rest of the time, it's kind of out there in the solar wind. These guys went there. They didn't get a massive... They got a large radiation dose, but not, not fatal, um, because they weren't there for very long. However, what they didn't know at the time, and this is one of only a couple of graphs I've got in this presentation, I, ha I can show this plot, and this is actually done by some colleagues at the uh, at RAL space, at STFC's Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, and what they've done is they've created a graph here, and so you can see it's a timeline. So this is 1968 over to 1972. So uh, well, this is the era of the Apollo missions, and actually the, the, the timing of the Apollo missions from Apollo 7 up to Apollo 17, which was the last mission to put people on the moon, is also indicated. So you can see, so, so Neil and Buzz were in, in 11 here, and Jim Lovell and Apollo 13 that everyone knows about was in here. Um, what they've also done on this timeline, these little sticks, these little orangey red sticks, are showing the total radiation dose you'd have got due to something called a solar energetic proton event. This is just a particular flavour of solar eruption that throws out energetic, positively charged subatomic particles, protons. And when you absorb them, it's not so good. And so you can work out the radiation dose that you'd get from these things. And you can see, and that's what's shown on this vertical axis. So basically, the taller the stick, the bigger the radiation dose. And there are a load of these events in this time. You can see there's a few here, and they go up higher and lower, and they have variable intensity. There's a whopper down here in 1972 that goes up here. Now, most of those skin doses in REM, they don't really mean very much to me. I don't really mean anything to anyone in the room. But a couple of lines have just been drawn on there now, just to give you some, some, some marks so you can gauge things. So this is, this is your annual natural radiation exposure. Everyone here will get that kind of dose, just from natural background radiation every year. Um, if you work in a nuclear facility, um, or you are classified as a radiation worker, perhaps you work in a hospital with radioactive sources or, or with x-rays, then health and safety m legislation would suggest you're allowed to have a slightly higher dose. Still not a dangerous dose, but higher than you would expect from the natural background. And that's this level. This kind of level then shows the sort of exposure that would give you short-term radiation sickness, which isn't very nice, so your teeth fall out, your gums bleed, your hair falls out, you start vomiting. Particularly unpleasant in zero gravity, I would imagine. Especially if you have to land something on the moon. It probably makes it difficult to concentrate. And this is the fatal dose, so this is kind of, you will die within sort of days um, if you get this dose. And you'll notice that throughout the Apollo era, the sun was erupting and chucking material out that was actually several times longer than the annual radiation dose you'd expect for a radiation worker. Well, hey, you've got to go to the moon. It's a pretty good trade-off, probably. But there are some up here, short-term radiation sickness, some down here that are also fatal. And as it happened, I mean, look at this one. It was slap bang between Apollo 16 and 17. They were just lucky. So they, they didn't know about this when they were running these missions. It's only afterwards we found this out. So, uh, so there are these just short flights, you know, there are a few days, a few days to the moon, a few days there, a few days back, let's say a week for a round trip. You can statistically miss most of these things. Just take potluck. You might get unlucky, but you can miss it. If you do want to go to Mars, though, it's going to take you six months to get there. You'll probably have to wait there for six months for Mars to come back into the correct position to make it back to Earth again. <coughs> and then it'll take six months to get back. So let's say you'll be in space 18 months. So if you imagine these sort of things on 18 months, you sort of pick up a lot of these events and the chances of, you know, you, and they build up, your dosage goes up and up and up, there's a drip drip effect, and there's, you know, may even be events, the chances of actually running into an event that will kill you gets quite large. So if we want to have adventures on Mars, we're probably going to have to worry about space weather and think of some clever solutions. Building spacecraft out of lead doesn't work for a variety of reasons, but the first being it's very, very heavy and therefore you can't build, you can't launch the thing. Um, so, if you want to understand weather 
here on, on, on the ground, you, you, the first thing to ask is, well, what season are we in? If you want to know if it's going to be rainy or not, well, are we in winter or are we in summer? Let's look at the trends. Well, you can do the same thing with the sun. And actually, this is a graph of sunspot numbers. So 400 years ago, when Galileo turned his first, first telescopes towards the sun, obviously that's a very bad idea, which I wouldn't recommend you doing, but after Galileo had figured out how to do it safely, he could observe little spots on the solar surface, little dark regions. And actually, he was doing this by projecting an image from a telescope onto a wall or a, or a screen. And he could draw them day after day, and he noticed they moved around. And that was how he realised the sun was a rotating ball, because these spots moved around as the sun rotated. And then, over hundreds of years, people have been counting these things, and very quickly, a pattern emerges. Every 11 years or so, the number of spots you see on the sun at any given time goes from a very small number to a very big number to a very small number again. And then they, it does it again and again and again, and it's an 11-year solar cycle. And so this is actually the sunspot number for the sun from 1950 up till 2013 at the end there. And you can see it's got this 11-year cycle. This is just the natural cycling of solar activity. It's like the sun's seasons, if you like. So you might think, well, if we're going to go to Mars or somewhere fun, then the way we should do that is we should go when the sun isn't very active, when it doesn't have very many spots. So you try and aim for one of these things. Unfortunately, although the sun throws out less coronal mass ejections, these enormous explosions at solar minimum, it throws out more solar energetic proton events at solar minimum. So if you miss one, the other one gets you. And also, the sun's magnetic field varies a bit like this as well. It gets very strong at solar maximum, and it's very weak at solar minimum. And actually, that shields us from radiation coming from outside of the solar system. So galactic cosmic rays, these are radiation left over from um, supernova elsewhere in the universe. When the sun's very strong, it actually acts like a big umbrella, and it shields us. When the sun's magnetic field is very strong, it shields us from, from galactic radiation. So you could go at solar maximum, and you'll be shielded from galactic radiation, but the sun is very active and chucking lots of stuff out. You could go at solar minimum, and the sun will throw out different types of particles, and its shielding from extra, extra solar system sources is lousy. So you kind of have to figure out what's the best choice, and, and none of them are easy answers to make. But it's things like this, this cycling, which, as you will notice, is heading upwards somewhere here. We're obviously 2012. It's things like that that have driven some funny headlines in recent months. And you might have noticed, well, recent years, in fact. So I've just got a couple, because they're quite fun. Um, so this is from the Daily Mail. Meltdown. A solar super superstorm could send us back into the dark ages, and one is due in just three years. <laughs> so this is a very confident prediction in April 2009 that a solar storm is going to arrive on 19th of April 2012 and send us all back to the dark ages. As you can see, it hasn't happened. Um, there is another one. This is one I quite like. So the next solar maximum is expected around 2012-13, potentially coinciding with the London <laughs> Olympic Games. I quite enjoy this one as well. So, um, so my golden rule is don't mention space weather and the Olympic Games in the same sentence, even though I just broke it then. Um, but what these are referring to is this solar cycle. So space weather is generally worse when the sun is at the maximum of its activity, and that occurs every 11 years or so. And you can actually go back hundreds of years to do this. And you can see, actually, that each cycle is not necessarily the same as the one before. There, you can not only see the trends in the 11-year cycle, but you can also see there are other trends in that you know, the, the height of the peak seems to vary, and the depth and the duration of the minimum will vary from one to the next. So it's a very complex structure, and there's some people who spend a lot of time just looking at this kind of thing. But what I put this up for is I want to take us back. Why do we care? You know, why are we spending taxpayers' money thinking about, about solar physics and space physics and space weather? Well, let's just go back in time. Let's take a trip to 1859, somewhere in here. So we're just after the end of the solar maximum. Uh, we're in Victorian Britain. And in uh, Red Hill, in near London, um, there is a very nice building. Actually, no, I'll move on from that in a minute. I'll come back to that in a moment. There is a gentleman astronomer by the name of Richard Carrington. R. Carrington Esquire, and this is an excerpt from a paper he sent to the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. So he was a gentleman astronomer making observations of the sun from his helioscope, his solar telescope. And he was drawing sunspots, so he was actually making these beautiful drawings of sunspot groups on the sun, when suddenly the whole room he was in brightened. Um, and he thought the maid had come in and opened the, you know, opened the blinds or something and was obviously about to tell her off. Realised it wasn't, the light was coming through the helioscope. Suddenly the sun, the region of the sun he was looking at, had brightened. And this was the first recorded observation of a white light, a visible solar flare. He's seeing, he just happens to be looking in the right place at the right time. He rushed off to go and get someone to tell them. And when they came back in the room, it had died away again. So there's a, an observa a rule for observational science there. You know, don't leave your observations when something exciting happens because you might miss it. 
And, and the, this is actually the Kew Observatory, uh, also near London, where at the time they were measuring the Earth's magnetic field. People were very interested in the Earth's magnetic field. We knew it wobbled about a bit over the day. There's a diurnal cycle. It moves around over the day. And we knew that was happening, and, it was, it, and that was useful for navigation. Um, but on that day, at about the same time Richard Carrington was observing this, the, the magnetometer had a little blip. It moved very quickly, suddenly. And that was because... The, the flare that Richard Carrington had seen in white light actually arrived also as X-rays and ultraviolet light, and it just tickled the upper atmosphere of the Earth. Ionised its light, so broke apart the atoms into electrically charged particles, which could then um, carry more current through the atmosphere. There's naturally occurring electrical current, but the increasing conductivity of the atmosphere because of the arrival of X-rays boosted those currents, and when you get electrical currents, you get magnetic fields. So as these electrical currents were boosted briefly overhead, they generated a strong magnetic field, which caused the magnetic field sensors on the ground, magnetometers, they, called to, they caused them to wobble a bit. And that's what some of these traces are. And, and I won't go into detail, but the next day, all hell broke loose. All these magnetometers all around the world, they all went off the scale. Something crazy happened. And what we now know happened was that there was a white light flare that Richard Carrington saw, and newspapers are obsessed with flares, but realistically, they don't generally cause too many issues. Some problems with the ionosphere and radio communication... But what happened that Richard Carrington couldn't see was a coronal mass ejection was launched towards the Earth at the same time as the flare. And it doesn't travel at the speed of light arriving in nine minutes. It moves quite slowly. Well, this one was a quick one. This, this did the Earth some distance in about a day. Usually they take about three to four days. But this was a biggie. This was like a perfect storm arriving. And when it arrived, very interesting things started to happen. So this sort of thing happened. The sky turned red in a lot of places. Um, and I have some extracts here from newspapers at the time. <laughs> And this one is from San Francisco, and the, uh, the person is talking about how the awful red glare over the houses, and this went on night after night. Um, I have another newspaper excerpt from, um, from New Orleans, where um, <laughs> I quite like this one, because it basically says, well, I'll read it out, I can't do the accent, but singular as it may appeal, appear, a gentleman actually killed three birds with a gun yesterday morning about one o'clock, a circumstance which has perhaps never had its like before. The birds were killed with the beautiful aurora borealis at its height, and being a very early species, larks, were no doubt deceived by the bright appearance of everything and came forth innocently, supposing it was day, where some New Orleans resident blasted them with a shotgun. <laughs> but but the, the aurora were bright enough over the southern parts of the USA, where you don't normally see them, but birds thought it was dawn. And similar things were happening high in the Rocky Mountains. Here's a, just an anecdote. that There was a party, perhaps they were on a wagon train or something, travelling through the Rockies, bright aurora, and they say some of the party insisted it was daylight and began the preparation of breakfast. So, you know, clever people, you know, adults, thought it was daylight because the aurora was so bright. So this event in 1859, which we call the Carrington event, created fantastic auroral displays. It was probably the biggest geomagnetic storm of, in modern history. It also had some effects on technology. So we have the Victorian internet, we have the telegraph system. So... We're going to look at a conversation that took place between two operators in the United States, in Boston and Portland. And bear in mind, this was like high tech, you know, being able to send messages over continents over minutes, unheard of. And they have a conversation, and it goes a little bit like this, and we'll see what they said. I'm assuming everyone can read Morse. <laughs> ah, um, OK, well, never mind. Um, what it says in plain, then, is, from one operator to the other, so uh, please cut off your battery entirely from the line for 15 minutes. And the Portland operator replies, beep, 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 beep. He says, will do. It's now disconnected. Beep, 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 beep. It's disconnected, OK? Boston, mine's disconnected, and we're working with the auroral current. How do you read my writing? So as a translation, he's saying, that's odd. We've both unplugged our batteries, and we're still talking to each other. It must be currents in the lines induced from these auroral displays overhead. How are you going? Portland operator says, well, better than with our batteries on. <laughs> current comes and goes gradually. And the Boston operator, Boston operator replies, my current is very strong at times and we can work wet better without the batteries as the aurora seems to neutralise and augment our batteries alternately, making current too strong at times for our relay magnets. So the translation, the current in the wire that they're trying to put in with their batteries, sometimes currents generated from the aurora overhead are pushing in the other way and making the system not work. And other times they're boosting their current, making it not work. So if they unplug things, it seems to work. So he says, suppose we work without batteries while we're affected by this trouble. And the response comes, very well, shall I go ahead with business? Boston, yes, go ahead. And off they go, <laughs> with no power at all. Now this is an amusing one, but actually some of these stations burnt down and the operators were electrocuted by this sort of thing. <laughs> Currents induced in copper lines were, were from the variations in the Earth's magnetic field being buffeted from the solar wind and the space environment um, actually caused problems with the technology. <laughs> 
So communications technology was hit. Now, in this part of the world, if you wanted to get around, your train would have looked a bit like this. This is a London and Northwestern passenger locomotive at the end of the 1850s. Uh, it's all steel and iron and wood and brass and coal and water and oil. And it's completely invulnerable to any of the effects of the, sp of the sun. Fast forward. So, we're now today. Um, I should also say other train operators are available. Um, <laughs> but we have here a system where there's lots of semiconductors, lots of computers embedded in this system. GPS satellite systems to do timing and signal. When you get your Wi-Fi on board, you're talking via a satellite. You've got electricity that you need to make this train run. So there's a lot of high-tech systems on just everyday things like trains. And we also have an awful lot of our systems reliant on satellites. You simply would not believe the number of times you have used a satellite today. You, you just would not believe the number of times, and you will not have even known it half the time. So we rely on satellites, some of them in low Earth orbit, some of them in high Earth orbit. And of course, sometimes we'd elect to take ourselves above the Earth's atmosphere. So we want to fly above the atmosphere, and the atmosphere is protecting us from radiation from the sun. And things have changed a bit. So, so Concorde, 50-year-old you know, technology, wonderful machine, but it was, it was levers and wires and things generally making things happen. Um, this thing, a modern aircraft on the bottom right-hand corner, the pilot is not connected to the control surfaces by anything mechanical. When he does something, a jury of computers to select whether or not he's done the right thing and will send the appropriate messages to the control surfaces, which makes you able to build efficient um, aircraft. But you rely on those computers being there. And so if you have changes in the radiation environment in the upper atmosphere, for example, single event upsets, as they're sometimes known, uh, um, electrons spiraling in from space and crashing into semiconductors, causing problems with computers, you obviously want to build a computer which is above the shield of the Earth's atmosphere that will, will be tolerant to that sort of thing. So aircraft manufacturers have to worry about space weather when they're building their aircraft. Um, incidentally, Concorde workers, Concorde flew very high, about 50,000 to 60,000 feet. Concorde workers were all radiation workers. They had to be radiation monitored because the radiation dose they got from space was much higher than in regular aircraft. And had they not been radiation workers, then they wouldn't have been allowed to, to fly on Concorde. Um, and of course, uh, airline crews are monitored generally. There are instruments on board the spacecraft so that they can do a dose every month or so. Not in real time, but you can at least see what's going on. But a, a captain, for, Vir well, for, uh, a captain for, for Virgin Atlantic, I know, who is, um, who is interested in space weather and is, is, is doing some research, he says to me that, well, you know, there are, um, there are some passengers who travel a lot more than airline crews and no one's monitoring them. So it's, there's some interesting issues about public safety and, and space weather. Um, we tend to fly over the polar regions a lot more than we used to. Well, during the Cold War, you couldn't fly over this region. It would have been very dangerous. Whereas now, the quickest destination to get between, the quickest way to get between Chicago and Hong Kong is to fly over the polar routes. But the polar regions, where the Earth's field is pointing down to the Earth, is where material gets funneled into the upper atmosphere. It's where radiation, uh, sorry, radio communications get most affected during solar activity. And so actually, there are issues. And one airline um, spent, in one year alone, $200 million on extra fuel and things to make sure so that when the sun was active, they had to fly around longer at lower latitudes in order to, to safeguard their equipment and their passengers from, from space weather effects. So it's affecting you every day, even though you don't necessarily know about it. But the biggie is really the power grid. There is some concern that a very large event like the Carrington event could do some damage to our power grid. So people at Lancaster, myself included, are working with the power companies um, to, uh, um, and people like the British Geological Survey to try and make estimates of how changing magnetic fields in the, upper, in, in the Earth's environment will cause currents to throw through the, uh, th flow through the, um, the power grid. And actually, this is just a slide of some, um, some transformers of a power grid um, in another country that were damaged by bad space weather during the Halloween storm, which we had some, data, um, some movie of earlier. And I'm not going to worry about too much about what that graph shows. But you can see here there are burnt out components. And these are actually coming from a power grid in <coughs> South Africa. So they're not near the North Pole, where you expect the northern lights and the space weather to be bad and affect the Earth. They're actually quite a long way near the magnetic equator. And the concern is really that this will happen. If the power goes off, imagine if there was a large event that knocked down most of the power grid and damaged a lot of the transformers, such that you couldn't bring the power grid back up again. Those transformers are the size of a house, and it typically takes years to, uh, to get them delivered after you've ordered them. There aren't warehouses full of them. It's, it's a slow process. So if you imagine just for a moment the power grid went out and what didn't come back up for, say, two months. Well, at first, obviously, it would be kind of irritating. Um, then you'd start to think, well, how do you pump fuel out into your car? Because there's no pumps at the garage that are working. Or how do the people who use trucks to move food around into the supermarket, how will that work if they can't get fuel out of the ground and fuel moved around? 
Um, how will, for example, refrigeration work and water processing if there's no electricity? How will drugs work? How will the emergency services cope if, if the power outage went beyond a few days? So this is where you get into sort of this scary sci-fi zombie movie type stuff. But it is the kind of thing that concerns governments. So this isn't meant to scare you. It's meant to just show you that there are people out there thinking. And actually, the US government did a survey. And they, um, reckon, they, they tried to work out what would happen if the Carrington event happened today. And they said in the worst, worst case scenario, they would expect there to be about $1 to $2 trillion worth of damage to the US economy in the first year afterwards. Um, and that's just a comparison there with Hurricane Katrina. Of course, these numbers used to sound big until the economic crisis. Um, <laughs> but, but they reckon it would take years to recover from this sort of thing. So it doesn't surprise you that the US government is, very, is thinking very seriously about its infrastructure, as is the UK government. And there are actually gr agreements to share information between them about how that would work. Um, and so, yes, this isn't meant to scare you, but I will be in the bar afterwards. If anyone wants to come and see me, um, <laughs> I can sell you a Solar Storm survival kit. <laughs> but seriously, um, extreme space weather, it's what they call a high-impact, low-frequency event. Something which, if it happened, would be very, 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 very bad, potentially, but is unlikely to happen very often. And so there are other types of things which we're more used to dealing with. So volcanic eruptions, so, so large volcanic eruptions. This is Mount St. Helens. Massive damage, but not expected to happen, and probably beyond the sphere of experience of most people involved. There is a, a tale of a chap who lived on the slopes of Mount St. Mount, Mount St. Helens who was told he should probably move by the scientists and the government, and he said, I, no one's going to tell me to move. I've lived on this mountain all my life. Nothing's going to happen. It went bang. The valley he lived in is now 50 metres underground. You can't, you know, and he was killed. Now, it wasn't because he was stupid or stubborn. It was because he'd lived on that mountain 80 years and he'd never seen it go bang in the way that it went bang in the end. It was totally beyond his experience. And that could apply to other things, you know, tsunamis. No one would have predicted this. In fact, it would have been very difficult to predict and, and organise a tsunami defence system the day before it happened. The day after it happened, it was an obvious no-brainer. It was just no-brainer. Pandemic flus, earthquakes, all these kind of big things that you'd expect your government to be thinking about. And I am pleased to say that the government is, and there's a couple of very long documents here, but you know, the British National Security Strategy, there's a evidence, a scientific evidence in, in emergencies commit, um, report there from the House of Commons. Um, the British National Risk Register has severe space weather in there now. It's alongside other things like flu and extreme heat waves and terrorism, things like that. So the government thinks about it quite a bit and, and puts into place um, procedures of how to take advice on what to do. Much like if there's, say, a volcanic ash cloud. They now know which scientists to talk to about that. So to leave on, a, on an interesting, on a happy note, um, <laughs> although things are, uh, there's a lot of work being done uh, to look at space weather, the thing is we only have one sun. Now if you were to do a medical trial, you wouldn't try your drugs on one person. You'd find hundreds of people to try it on. And then you'd get a, a, a broad response to what the, that drug did and you could then make some inferences about how good it was and what the problems were. Well, we only have one sun to study and we've only been studying it in space for 50 years, which isn't very long. And so these large events like the current event probably occur every few hundred years. Uh, the last one's 150 years ago. So there's a reasonable chance there might be another one in the next 100 years. What some astronomers are doing is they're looking at stars in other parts of the universe that are very much like our own. Our own star is very boring, very typical, very middle-aged. Um, and they're looking at similar stars to see how active they are. Because if you look at lots of stars and get a feeling for an activity of, in, a, in a pattern of activity of stars like our own, it should teach us more about our own um, star's activity and, and how often these sort of things can happen. And so years ago, no one would have cared about this. If you live on the plains of the Serengeti, you still won't care about it. But if you rely on a GPS system to land your aircraft, or you rely on an electricity grid or satellite communications, or you want to fly across the oceans, then these things have changed. And it's not that the natural system has changed. It's just we've built machines that we rely on, which are more vulnerable to space weather effects than, than, our, um, than some of the natural systems. But if you would like to know, next time the sun is doing its thing with space weather, you perhaps know to look out of your window and take a picture. Um, I'm just going to leave it tonight that um, our group at Lancaster in the physics department actually runs a service called Aurora Watch. Perhaps some people in the room have signed up for it. And what we do is we take real-time measurements of the Earth's magnetic field. And when we're getting a kicking from the solar wind, we can detect it. And we can send out emails, and you can either go Facebook or Twitter or, um, uh, or, or get an email alert to your whichever device you want, which says, the aurora might be out tonight. It could be worth looking. And that's how I knew to take that photo a couple of weeks ago. So space weather can have some nasty consequences as well, but it's when the space weather is actually particularly active that the aurora come down from their usual hiding place at the edge of the Arctic Circle. They come much further south than you can see them from the UK. So I'd encourage anyone who's interested in doing that to sign up.
And at that point, I'll leave it there. Thanks very much.